Crafty, and I'm visiting you here today from UCD, where I work in teacher education. My own area is the history of Irish education. And before I worked in teacher education, I was a school teacher uh, at secondary level in a large community school in Dublin. So my work with the presentations across the last 18 months has been around the history of the congregation. And I like to look at uh, the history of women religious as part of a transnational impulse, an impulse that carries across national borders, uh, an impulse that is inclusive and not exclusive. So I've been very pleased to work with the presentations and my own graduate research students have worked with them across the last year on a number of projects that I'm going to mention this morning. As they are released across the coming year, they will be of some use, I think, to some schools in different ways. And you'll be able to discern whether or not you want more information about them or whether you'd like any of our research team to even visit schools and talk to your pupils about some of the things that we've done or some of your teachers and how they might like to adapt some of the work we've done. So I've called the presentation, the, this presentation, from Nano Nagel to Nanotechnology, and it's not a trite comment or a glib title. I brought a, a module onto our undergraduate curriculum in UCD this year so that we could introduce the history of presentation education and the 300-year transnational span. But when I talked to first-year undergrads uh, to find out what they know about nano, they said it's, it's the science of small things. It's, it's about nanotech. It's about your iPhone. And it, it's a very interesting observation that it's about the science of small things. Many of you will have read a novel called The God of Small Things. And if we think about Nano's own work, and she was quite a small person, um, she concentrated on the small things too. I thought it was an interesting kind of observation that they made. They weren't talking about Nano Nagel at all. They were talking about that. For many of them, that is the God of young kids nowadays. And that is what travels with them. And it is that little piece of nanotech enabled, uh, that little nanotech enabled device that hovers in their pockets the whole time and their iPad and their computers. That is the way that they mediate everything outside. So some of the projects we develop have to engage with that because that's the only thing they're going to look at anyway. Um, so what I wanted to just share with you this morning is what, what we were about and what, what I'm interested in and what I think is probably going to be important to presentation schools across the, the coming year. The big challenge is to connect the past, the long past, 300 years if we go back to our birth date, with the present, and to see some way that that will continue into the future. Some way to harness a discussion about a woman's legacy and to make it bigger and wider than that little person. What is her legacy about? Has it any relevance or resonance for young people today? And if they are not able to find it, how can adults help them to find it? What I always say when I speak to um, groups about faith education, which I've done in other contexts too, is some of what you teach may be rejected and the pupils may walk away from it. But they may drift back to it later. It's like just sounding something in the background that they may come back to later. Across this year, I can see from the choir, for example, and I know I've talked to many presentation school principals before, and we always have presentation um, PME students on our teacher training courses. There's a huge awareness of nano, and there's a huge understanding of the presentation legacy. So it would be easy to say, there's nothing else to do. We have it. It's sorted. But it's about looking into the future when we're not here, when there are no sisters around anymore to help mediate that history, and about organizing things so that it's, it's kind of like good custodial care of a person's legacy. So one of the things, one of the many things, that we can embed that discussion in is around values, and that has always interested teachers. Can the life of one person give the rest of us some values that help us to live a meaningful life? That means that our time here was not wasted. 
Now, I'm talking to mainly educators today, and I know as a teacher a f and a former school teacher that when you go to an event, you want to come back with some darn thing that's practical. And teachers are practical people, and sisters are practical people. My experience always of working with women religious is they get down to the business pretty quickly. So my approach really is to talk to you in a practical way about a couple of the tools that we've developed. Because you all have, as educators, the imagination to decide whether you're going to take them and run with them, or whether there are other things that interest you across this year to take and run with. And again, to come back to my own impetus, it's very much for me, as a historian of women religious, about understanding the global impact that those sisters had. This is a huge story. The story of the presentations worldwide and what started in this country and went global is enormous. They're one of the biggest teaching congregations of women religious in the history of world education. That's not a small thing at all. I'm going to just deviate for one minute. And I want to tell you a small story, and some of you may know it, so bear with me. I was, as part of some of the research for our projects, I've been traveling around as many of the Irish archival collections of presentation convents and schools as possible, and the international archives, to find where did the nano story go? How was it picked up, and how was it passed on? And two weeks ago, I was in Newfoundland. I used to always call it Newfoundland, but now I call it Newfoundland, because they've told me that's the right way to do it. And I was staying with the sisters in their convent, their mother house, in St. John's for three days. And some of you will know the story of how in 1833, pre-famine Ireland, four women left Galway. A few weeks before that, I'd been down in Galway with the uh, archives there. They left Galway and made a truly terrifying sea voyage the whole way to Newfoundland to make a foundation, to start a school and to bring education to girls there who would not otherwise have had schooling at all. Their journey was terrifying. It was harrowing, as ships' journeys in the 1830s were anyway. And when they had not been heard of for many months, it was assumed, as happened in those days, that they were lost at sea. And the sisters did what was common in those days. They burned the vows of the four pioneers who had left them, and they had a memorial service in their memory, and they grieved them. But fortunately, the problem only was that all of the letters the sisters were sending back during their journey and when they landed had been held up in Liverpool. And when the pack of letters finally arrived in Galway, the Galway community could see that their women had survived. They had made that huge journey and they were starting to plant another tiny little seed and make a new foundation. Now, that kind of history, I believe, as an educator, is really inspiring for young women. And for young men, too. I know you have boy students. It's not just girls. But girls have been sidelined in the general historical narrative. And these are really good stories about Irish girls and women. The young women who went to make foundations in the 1840s, right in the middle of the famine period, in India, from Ireland, to found presentation convents, they were very young. They were as young as my students in college. Some of them were younger. They were as young as sixth year students in school. The kind of courage and vision that those young people had is very inspiring and well, I believe, well worth harnessing, which is what we're trying to do in, in the book publication that will be released next year. So it's trying to take material to do with my curriculum, teaching in third level, I'm also thinking of your curricula in second and in primary, and to say, where does these stories fit into the curriculum? Can you embed them in the curriculum? And for me, because these are my disciplines, the easiest places for me to go are history, geography, and English. 
and that broad term that's used nowadays, the use of the past. How can we use the past to teach nowadays? For history teachers here, they remember that, that requirement that we are meant to teach our young children the skills of the historian. What better way to teach your children the skills of the historian than by looking at the sources about those presentations? World history and geography, climate, travel, mapping, and the use of digital mapping tools, they all allow us to access presentation history and that huge movement of those thousands of women around the world. Writing in English, through our English classes, and particularly creating narratives, and blogging, and filmmaking, and drama, which you're already working so hard on, and music, are ways of taking the story and reinventing it, sometimes in a language that Nan and Nagel probably would have been horrified to hear, but that doesn't matter. What I'm curious to know at my students is, do you get the main message? Do you understand the main message? I don't mind if they say, hashtag lol. That doesn't bother me. I want to know, did you hear the main message? So what the projects then, just to summarize them, uh, that I'm involved in, and one project that we've used uh, and connected with quite strongly down in Cork, Shane is going to talk about that, um, are these. Working with the presentations, UCD Digital Library has created a digital collection of the surviving writing by Nano Nagel. Only a very small amount of her primary sources, her own letters have survived. And that will be released globally in June at a launch. It will be, you will be able to connect to it through UCD Digital Library, which is an open, free resource. Download the letters and determine, is there a way I can use those in my classes? Is there a way I can use them even for around a discussion group or a, or a thinking group? Now, it was technology, it was actually the science of small things that made it possible for us to do that project. And for some people, they're far more interested in the science of the digitization than the content of the letters. I have to put up with that. But it may be that in being interested in how we digitized the letters and represented them, they will become interested also in the content of the letters. The second thing, um, that we are creating, which will be released, uh, and it, it, this is also under Creative Commons license, the whole world gets it at the same time, is a digital exhibition on Nano Nagel and presentation history, which will be released through the platform Google Arts and Culture. If you're a Google addict, and there we're back to the signs of small things again, you will probably use Google to search for other things. So at some time, once the announcement has been, has been released by the leadership team, all you have to do is Google, Google Arts and Culture. Some of you may have used it in your teaching. It is the most glorious resource for taking people around the world to see things that many of us will never see. I haven't yet seen the Taj Mahal in real time, but seeing it in Google Arts and Culture is a pretty good second best. There are lots of people who aren't going to see presentation uh, materials and resources and archival content <coughs> in real time. But through Google Arts and Culture, some of that story will be available. We, we used quite a lot the archives that, are, uh, that belong to the society that are at Nanonagel Place. And across the time of the research, the finishing touches were being put to, excuse me, the exhibition at Nanonagel Place. I think there are quite a few people here who have seen it. I imagine there's going to be a stampede to it across the coming year because it really is so beautiful. Um, and I, I know I've, I've gone on about this quite a lot, but in my field, I've visited an awful lot of archives worldwide. The archive that has been built there is the gold standard in archiving. And the exhibition center and interpretive tool that has been put in place is top notch. You would travel on your holiday to go to it if it was in another country. 
So that really hands teachers and pupils an awful lot of resources. But passive engagement resources, as we know as teachers, doesn't work. There has to be something to make the child think further, to make the young person engage with it and think about it. It was with a more adult um, market in mind, or audience, I should say, that we um, are, are bringing out a new uh, publication, Nano Nagel, The Life and the Global Education Legacy, which is to tap into that historical narrative. How do these ordinary Irish women start this up and go and connect with other women from all over the world? And those women, in turn, took up their bags and went. And I know from working in collections that belong to the um, Indian collection, the San Francisco collection and so on, it was hard work. Um, so to come back then, just to give you a tiny look at before I conclude, I know we're on a very rigid time today and I want to be punctual. To come back to those projects and how they pan out and how I'm using them, and you can think yourselves as teachers, well, what might I do with that if I was to get in touch with them and use that? In digitizing the letters, the, the, the story and the technology of digitization, as many of you will know, it's not the same as scanning. And when people realize that digitizing isn't scanning, sometimes young people become fascinated by the art, uh, whole art and technology around writing metadata and creating something that can be harvested and made safe in a secure platform and used in lots of different ways. But the first step is the scanning, and we, we would have the um, state-of-the-art digital scanner in the university. It belongs to UCD Digital Library. So the sisters brought in pieces that could be brought in, and where we had to go, we had to uh, hire other pl uh, people at different sources to be present to do uh, scanning of other material that can't be moved. And that reminds young people, I'm mean, back to the skills of this story, of the fragility of something that is nearly 300 years old. It's remarkable that they've survived it all. They will survive longer because from now on people won't have to handle them or touch them, but they will be able to blow them up to a huge size. Now if I'd scanned, uh, not scanned, but, but transferred over this letter at a, at a higher resolution, we could actually have it the whole way across the wall. You could project it on the front of your building for the year if you wanted. Or you could sh show a different letter every day of the week across the back of the hall if you wanted. Um, because they would be free under Creative Commons license as a, as a gift of the presentations. And I've just put one letter here that I used with my first years. I have to tell you, first years, when they come in in September, they're not that much different from when they leave you in June. <laughs> Truly. And I have a son who's a first year, so I know. Actually, they're not that much different from when they leave you in third year. So you have to do a fair amount of leading. But the first letter is a great letter to teach with because it's the letter where she talks about her journey and why she did what she did. And it's the letter where she describes, it's quite dramatic, how dangerous and um, naughty, really, it was for her to set up that school and potentially bring danger on her own family in penal Ireland, uh, in Cork. And she describes that quite well in this. And it is precisely because it's such a graphic letter that I used just that one. The only thing I wanted to achieve in my first session with them, because some of them didn't have a history background, was do they get what it was for a woman to do that? The risks and the terror and the danger. And do they get why she might have done this? Now, this small piece of the letter, resolution isn't good enough for you to read it, but some of you know these letters anyway. It's the one where she says that her brother finally realizes and almost forgives her for what she's done. But his anger is what she has to face first and the concern of her sister-in-law. And a very simple exercise that I created just to see, did they get it? Because they like to talk, as we all know, in sound bites. Was, I just used some simple cartoons that would suggest to them the drama of just that letter. It was up to them to decide who's who in the cartoon, but they're fairly suggestive. 
It's, it's, it's easy enough to kind of get where we're going with this one. And I wanted them to work in different groups and animate the cartoon in such a way that we could create a tiny little play or drama of just that moment when somebody has to, as they would say, fess up. Oops, look what I've done. And your brother has to say, do you realize what you've done? But we have to understand why she did it and what's going to happen next. Now, I told them they could write in any language they liked and they could use any kind of um, dialect or slang. It didn't really matter. We were getting at the essence of it. And they all cracked it. Every one of them, it really surprised me. And they would be from many faiths and none. They all got what happened in that letter and in that moment by trying to say it and articulate it just through a very simple cartoon exercise. We've also brought uh, a student group to see would it work with a graduate group. I just wanted to test the ground and see would graduate groups get the exhibition or does it read better for younger groups? It read very well for graduate groups. Um, down to Nano Nagel Place. <coughs> and they, as you can see, they were compelled by what they saw on the walls. And of course, there's an Im immensely creative use of your nanotech enabled devices down there in the touchscreen technology that's all around. We had a small piece of film here, but it's, it's for some reason our tech is not working on my Mac for it to play for you. But this student is, will, uh, they always save their videoed assignments to YouTube. So it will be on YouTube. All of, the, all of them will be on YouTube once they present them to me anyway. But what I asked the students to do was to consider creating a small mini video film to interpret their experience. They really got it. And they all made their tiny film on that. They had it done this very quickly. So to close, I'm back where I began. I'm back with the kind of stuff I like to do. And again, this is a, a teaching tool that many, many of you might have used in class. It's the free software that you get on Google to create Google Maps and to drop pins on different points. And one way of getting the kids to realize just how daring these sisters were is to pin all the schools and convents they founded. You'll be able to get them from the book we're bringing out and you'll be able to get them from other resources that exist and to pin the amazing journeys they made. And that's the pin that I dropped last week when I got back from San Francisco, uh, from um, Newfoundland, reminding me of the horrendous journey that those women took from Galway in 1833. So I leave you with my two reflection points. What does it mean for you and for your students to be part of presentation history? It's a long, important story. And what can the trajectory of Nan O'Nagel's life mean to young people now and going into the future? Thank you very much. Yeah.